Hi, this is Jonathan Lehman. Uh, here I am with Pastor's Talk. Mark Dever's not with me today, but I do have a couple of close friends. Bobby Jamison, who you've probably met before if you're a regular listener. He's an associate pastor here at Capitol Hill Baptist. And Bobby, we're doing a book club. Book club. With your book, Sound Doctrine. On so, May 22nd. Yeah, that's right. And how's that going to work? I don't know. Live, people ask questions and yeah. we talk to them on the computer. Something, <laughs> something, something like that. <laughs> something like that. 1 and p.m. Al- Eastern. And also with us is Mark Feather, a pastoral assistant, but also an elder. I know. We're not going to talk lay, about the tension. Lay elder on staff at the church. As a pastoral assistant, not as a pastor. That's right. We're just going to let that tension exist there in the podcast either i guess liam and i know and jameson i've heard of, but who are you <laughs> <laughs> um our our topic Mar- mark's and mark's traveling at the moment and yet these two brothers are wonderful conversation partners on the doctrine of the trinity bobby has written a book that is more directly about biblical exegesis but particularly around the doctrine of god yeah that's right and the trinity and christology right Yep. And Biblical reasoning, is- Trinitarian and Christological rules for exegesis. We co-wrote yeah. with Tyler Whitman, who yeah. teaches theology at New Orleans. Mm. I remember a number of years ago, Bobby, you said this is the Trinity is a, I think you said a hobby of yours, which is a bit awkward to say. <laughs> the Trinity is a <laughs> hobby. At least I didn't say the Trinity is my homeboy. <laughs> yeah, no, that's no. Right. I, guess, I, I guess maybe what you said, the doctrine, studying the doctrine of the Trinity sure. is a, a, a something that you kind of do on the side and have long done on the side. Long-standing and, interest. Yeah, and and Mark, you mm. recently described yourself as Mark Devers' conciliary <laughs> on the doctrine of the Trinity. I think I was described as such. Uh, we're conversation partners on that. Whenever things would come up in service review about the Trinity, I was often a uh, protagonist in in those discussions. But anyway, a protagonist of what? The Trinity? Uh, no, I, I think a main interlocutor of uh, Dever on Trinitarian stuff. He's okay. a partisan supporter of the Trinity. I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Trinity. Someone <laughs> writes books on the Trinity. I I just love the trinity you know pray i delight in the trinity as michael reese would say yeah Yeah. and i presumably you've read a number of topic uh, books on this topic sure yeah and are just it's it's one of the areas that you like to show up in and think about discuss and so forth yeah that's right um well it, it occurred to me that you know here we've done 250 or so episodes of pastor's talk and i don't think we ever talked about the doctrine of the trinity so the first question for both of you brothers would be one is a pastor one is a lay pastor mm-hmm. why should busy pastors spend time thinking about the doctrine of the trinity mark goes first he's got the top of his head <laughs> um there's lots of reasons you know the the first one you know if you think about stephen holmes who's a, a theologian and thinks a lot about the trinity as well he's going to argue we need to defend the fact that the trinity is useless and what he's essentially saying there is that uh, god is is a means to no greater end uh, he is the great end uh and so we we want to study god first and foremost for himself yeah. um the the whole purpose of healthy churches is to promote healthy christians who worship a great god yeah. And, and the Trinity is that great God that we yeah. get to worship. Um, I think secondly, uh, you know, in evangelism and apologetics, the Christian conception of God is so different than the other conceptions of God out mm-hmm. there. Uh, our God is is fruitful and and full of life in himself, uh, and he overflows in that uh, creation and redemption. And we essentially just get to see that, uh, the triune life being worked out in creation and redemption. So really sweet in those ways. Uh, I think uh, it, it, the Trinity is really key for putting together the rest of your doctrine if you are off on the trinity there's probably going to be downstream effects in the rest of your yeah that's right yeah yeah mark gave us three good reasons i would add a couple more or some other dimensions to those one is that um the doctrine of the trinity is a theological workout in a number of senses so we're thinking about god in himself god as he has existed from all eternity and the fact that the, the Trinity inherently uh, wrestles with the given reality of God's unity, his oneness of essence, and the threeness of persons, it's kind of category breaking. There, there, there's no ready-made human categories that sort of map onto the full reality. And you, so, you, you mean no ready-made analogy? Is that what you're saying? Well, there, there is no uh, adequate analogy for the whole doctrine of the Trinity. Right. Although there are created analogies that Scripture does pick up and use for uh, individual relations of origin, like uh-huh. the son being the word of the father or the son being the radiance of the father's glory or right. the spirit proceeding or coming forth as breath. Uh, so there are analogies to individual uh, relations of origin 
though there's no good analogy for the whole trinity no, uh, sh no shamrocks no, no shamrocks no water. ice ice water vapor all <laughs> that kind yeah, of stuff right. um so it's a theological workout in the sense that we ha we have to stretch beyond all creaturely categories so it's it's humbling it's formative theologically for us to be okay, wrestling then, but, with pop, 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 yeah pause. i'm sorry Wor workout okay but what, what, why why is that crucial why is that crucial well uh, for for a pastor's i own, mean yeah it stretches my brain but so does calculus i mean <laughs> Oh, sure. But uh, in terms of getting to know God, uh -huh. getting to know the unity of Scripture, as Fred Sanders puts it, the Trinity is a great big doctrine. It, it takes in the whole uh, s terrain of Scripture and requires us to put it together from the very beginning to the very end. Mm -hmm. uh, the Old Testament prioritizes the oneness of God mm -hmm. and kind of prophetically foreshadows in some mysterious and riddling ways his, mm -hmm. his internal uh, plurality of persons. The New Testament, with the coming of Christ and the pouring out of the Spirit, gives us the the uh, in person, as it were, revelation of the Trinity, in the person of Christ, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then to, to arrive at a doctrine of the Trinity, you really have to put the whole Bible together in its fullness and texture. So I guess why would that theological why would that theological workout be a good thing? Well, it'll help you as a pastor come to know God better. It'll help you as a pastor put your own Bible together. And specifically, thinking about the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity is God as he is revealed to us in the gospel. So we also... Uh, the, the Trinity and the gospel map onto each other, each other, the Trinity and the gospel match each other. They're, they're mutually illuminating and clarifying. So when you're thinking about the Trinity, you're thinking about your salvation and the God of your salvation. I want to come back. That made, that made me think of the triune formula that we use when baptizing sure. people to mm -hmm. baptize somebody, father, in the name of the father, in the name of the son, in the name of the spirit and its connection to the gospel. Let me, let me stick that on the shelf. Sure. Guys, help me try to remember to bring that yep, back because sure. I, I want to stay on track here. So uh, a busy pastor needs to study for the sake of worship. Mm -hmm. You said that was your first yep. thing. It's useless. Mm -hmm. God is he is himself. Mm -hmm. We, we want to know him uh, for the sake of uh, evangelism. Mm -hmm. There I am in the, in the cab Yep. and I'm, I'm speaking to a, a Muslim or a, a Jehovah's witness as, as I did not too long ago. And I got to get these things straight uh, for the theological workout and understanding uh, the scripture mm -hmm. and how scripture works. Yep. I, am I summing it up? Yep. Mm. Yep. Okay. So how much time should a pastor spend studying and where should, and how should he study the doctrine of the Trinity? Mm. Well, those questions are tough because they vary based on a pastor's gifts, background, training, responsibilities, resources, all kinds of things. Okay. Um, okay. How about, let me, let me, let me tighten it. Yep. 2016, 17. Suddenly, everybody in the academic Christian academic community was was into the debates over the Trinity, sure. right? And I watched them sort of out of the corner of my eye. I didn't get in and read all the books, read all the papers. Should I have? Well, I think it's a. I think I think uh, how a I think I got the conclusions, but I wasn't going deep in. I'd uh, be quicker to recommend that a pastor set aside a little bit of time. Um, whether that's in his daytime schedule or kind of free time reading, I, I'd be more inclined and would recommend more strongly that a pastor set aside a little bit of time to be steadily growing in his understanding of major doctrines, including yeah, the Trinity. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that could be that could be reading modern, helpful, very clear uh, kind of books like Scott Swain's intro book on the Trinity with Crossway. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, it could be reading kind of classics like Athanasius on the Incarnation or his letters to Serapion, republished as works of the Spirit, uh, Athanasius and Didymus. Uh, or, or like a really beefy book, like an Augustine, you know, oh. on the Trinity, yeah. which that's going to be more for a pastor with a real serious theological appetite. But I'd, I'd encourage a brother either to, to read kind of really helpful contemporary stuff, a Steve Holmes, Fred Sanders, Scott Swain, uh, or classics that have stood the test of time rather than necessarily kind of, you know, feeling bound to, to follow whatever theological debate may be going on on the internet at the moment. Mm. Okay. The one, the one book right now, I got time for one book. What, what is it? Scott Swain's? I think so. I mean, it's really concise. It's really clear. He he handles scripture very well. He shows you how the doctrine arises from scripture. That's where I would start. Okay. Okay. I have a second mm -hmm. book. I, I have time for just one more. I'm going to come to you and ask you the same questions in a second, Mark. I'm not sure my answers will be entirely different, but. Oh, I. Uh, I'm really torn because I think biblical reasoning could fit into that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, biblical reasoning. But I'd really have some, rather have another man praise <laughs> okay, me. Okay, and sure. Okay, okay, okay. A third, a third book. A third, uh, a skipping third, over that third, one. Two third, and a half. Uh, 
Two and a half. Um, uh, I'm not sure. What's your follow up book? You would say you would start with Swain as well. Uh, yeah, but it just just to praise Bobby's book, Biblical Reasoning, which he writes with Tyler Whitman. Uh, not only does it have really good doctrinal content, you lo- get uh, a lot of those headline conclusions, yeah. but they also give you rules of interpretation, so they teach you to use your Bible better. So yeah. it's a really good book. Uh, you know, it is it is an academic workout to some degree, yeah. but really helpful. Uh-huh. Um, another book that I would give just for its didactic. Um, I think approach would be the deep things of God by Fred Sanders. Fred uh-huh. is super accessible in his writing. Yeah, he's he also, he makes, I think the, the right observation, evangelicals tend to care a lot about piety and practice. They care about salvation. They care about their devotional life, that sort of thing. You need to show how the doctrine of the Trinity relates to those things. And that's what he seeks to do in the deep things of God. And so it's a good resource for that reason. Go sign. Now, I think I, I told you guys this. I, I took a, a PhD seminar in the Trinity back mm. in 2005. And it seems like the conversation has changed a little bit. Um, we read Augustine. Sure. We read the Cappadocians. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that is what it is. I, I think maybe the course at the time that the favorite book uh, for people was, was uh, Robert Lethem's book. Sure. On the doctrine mm-hmm. of the Trinity. The Holy Trinity, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Uh, but more recent, none of you guys mentioned that book. What what happened? If have things changed in the way people think and talk about the Trinity between when I took that PhD seminar in 04, 05, 05 and today, it feels like they have. Hmm. Things have changed. Yeah, one of one appendix. I thought of my second book, Gregory of Nazianzus, his five theological orations, yeah. which the the convenient paperback edition of that is called "On God and Christ." That's the popular patristics version. I've assigned this in classes before to people with not much kind of background in it, and it is a little bit dense. Uh, but there are five really rich sermons that go through kind of the knowledge of God, doctrine of the mm-hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you you get in a very uh, rhetorically powerful, compressed kind of version, really classical Trinitarian theology, wrestling deeply with biblical text. So Mm -hmm. I would say Gregory of Nazianzus Mm -hmm. uh, is a great kind of primary source. Okay. Um, You know, Jonathan, to your question about what's changed in the last 20 years, there has been kind of a a harvest of patristic scholarship. Lewis Ayers, his his big book, Nicaea and its Legacy, is a very, very close reading of the development of pro-Nicene theology, major figures like the Cappadocians, really an account of fourth century Trinitarian theology as a whole. And that, that was kind of a new epic in, in patristic studies and Trinitarian theology. What year was that published? That was 2004. Okay. And there's been a lot of kind of cleanup work and refining stuff since then. I think, I think um, some clearer understanding of especially... Yeah, fourth century Greek speaking Trinitarian thought has kind of been filtering its way in to mm-hmm. evangelical theology mm-hmm. through works like those of Lewis Ayers and others. I think there's also been a broader grappling with more scholastic elements of our Christian theological tradition. So whether that's wrestling with people like Aquinas uh, or even going back to Augustine, um, or especially like Reformed scholasticism, figure, mm-hmm. figures like. Uh, Turretin or Maastricht has been recently republished. I mean, Maastricht has an awesome 80 pages on the Trinity hmm. in his volume on the Trinity. The kind of Trinity proper section is really good. It's it's dense. It's it's uh, some some heavy uphill climbing, but he starts every section with exegesis. Uh, he there's a devotional kind of application at the end of every section, hmm. and and in typical scholastic fashion, there's a lot of really careful distinctions. But it's just a supercharged 80 pages. So I think people have been. Wrestling with um, evangelical theologians, I think. Have so a lot been, of this is the what folks refer to as the retri- ret- retrieval. Yes, the there's retrieval. been a lot of good retrieval happening. And I think, frankly, there's also been um, some development in wrestling with how do we get these things from Scripture. Hmm. Um, there's been, I think, an infusion of some of these things in modern biblical scholarship. Scholars like a, a, a Richard Bauckham, Cavan Rowe, even Wesley Hill's more recent book from like 2015. Um, so I do think there's been some crystallizing, refining, advancing, you know, nothing brand new. The Trinity is the Trinity <laughs> and the church has known the Trinity all along, but kind of harvesting some riches from our own. What's, what's been at our theological disposal all along that maybe we haven't taken full stock of. Yeah. 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 Changing direction slightly. How does Trinitarian theology impact church life? Hmm. Well, to borrow from the shelf that you had earlier, uh, the ba- baptism is a great example of that. Uh-huh. Uh, and so everyone enters into the church and into the Christian life publicly through being named by the triune God. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're identified with him. Uh, and so th- that certainly is is 
I think, typical of the Christian life, that our life is one lived in fellowship with this great God. And in some sense, I think this is Scott Swain in his book. He's basically unpacking Matthew 28, uh, the baptismal formula that Jesus gives us, uh, that the whole of the Christian life is just growing into that name uh, Mm -hmm. and knowing the one in whom we have been baptized. I think also, and this would be borrowing from Lethem's book, uh, The Holy Trinity, that God's approach to us in his Son and through his Spirit is the way in which we ascend back Mm -hmm. to God in worship. That's borrowing from Ephesians as well. Is it Ephesians 2 or, yep. or, or Through four. him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That's right. Two. So as God yeah. comes to us uh, <laughs> through his Son and in his spirit, in his spirit and through his Son, we draw near to the Father. Michael uh, Horton's really good in that in his book yeah. on the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah. Using that formulation over and over. Yeah. So that's well, a good resource for people. And I mean, Sinclair Ferguson on his book on the Holy Spirit, he, he'll often opine that, uh, you know, we often think about this, the Trinity as this uh, philosophical abstraction. Uh, it's, it's so hard. Why, why give our our thoughts to such a great mystery. Yeah. He said when Jesus wanted to comfort his people on the night when he was going, or the night before he was be betrayed, John kind of 13 through 17, a lot of it is just Trinitarian theology. Mm-hmm. I want to comfort you with the mm-hmm. spirit who's going to mm-hmm. be here. And That's I, a great point. through that spirit, are going to be with you. So it's an imminently practical doctrine if it's applied well. It's funny. People don't think of it as practical though yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. And so if I should, okay, just unpack that for me a bit more. It's practical because when somebody is struggling with discouragement, what? I, I don't come to them and talk to them yeah. about, you know, th- three persons, one nature. I, I, what, what is it in that moment, say, of pastoral counseling or mm. in that moment of leading people into prayer? What is it that's practical? about the doctrine of the Trinity. Just trying to unpack what you just said. Yeah, I think a couple of things. So one, one of the great promises in scripture is that God would be with us. And so Jesus in that upper room discourse is gonna say, I'm not gonna leave you as orphans. I'm Mm -hmm. gonna send you my spirit. Mm -hmm. And in my spirit, I will come and be with you and my father also. And so insofar as you have the spirit, Christian, you're not alone. Though you're you're struggling through a hard providence, that there's suffering in your life, that there's sin in your life, your God is with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think also whenever we're dealing with sin and problems with assurance associated with that, um, the the rock solid assurance is that the the spirit of God is working out the the great plan of God's redemption in your life through sanctification, and that you ultimately stand before the Father based on the work of the Son of God. Mm-hmm. And so the whole triune God is working for your redemption amidst all your your big bad sins in your life. Those mm-hmm. are just a few different ways to apply it. You know, Jonathan, I, I agree entirely with Mark's answer. And one way you can answer this question would be to to look at the, the question of what does it impact the church's life? Yeah. Or how is it practical? Or yeah. Both? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You could read through Romans 8 and ask, what impact does the doctrine of the Trinity make on Christian life and practice? And it's just everywhere. You know, think about the Spirit being life in our bodies, uh, chapter mm-hmm. 8, verse 10, uh, putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit, the Spirit who dwells in us and empowers us, uh, the Spirit bearing witness and assuring us in chapter 8, verse 16, that if that we are children of God, if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So, so there's a there's a a Trinitarian shape and structure to the Christian life mm. that's deeply assuring, empowering, comforting. Uh, yeah, I mean, that'd be a good exercise to kind of just bring that question to the whole chapter of, of Romans chapter eight. Mm. If you're thinking more about the corporate life of the church. Well, hold, 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 yeah. hold that thought. Yeah. I want to come back to it. So are you saying it's almost as if I, as a Christian life, I'm, or a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a series of struggles. I'm waking up in the morning and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, begging Lord for help with this or that and so forth. There's almost a sense in which I'm interacting with God as Trinity. I'm kind of, you know, I know he's a comfort with me, but I know he's advocating for me as I'm thinking through different persons of the Trinity. I, I, I know the Father has sent and ordained these things. In, in my, yep. So it's just mm. subjectively, as it were. Thinking in prayer and thinking in uh, a Godward direction is that there's a sense in which reading through Romans 8, as you say, allows me, again, subjectively to posture myself in slightly different ways according to whether I'm thinking through the work of the Son, the work of the Spirit. Obviously, they, they all work together in all of their acts, but is there still a sense in which, insofar as one is foregrounded in, in comfort or one is foregrounded in intercession and, and or you know ordaining and so forth i'm posturing my prayers differently or help me understand I think so you could say there's there's sort of trinitarian channels that those different ways of relating to god flow in so yeah. so if i'm looking for assurance that my sins are forgiven i'm going to flip back 
back to Romans 5, we, you know, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's uh-huh. through his sacrifice, through his righteousness, through his vicarious obedience. There's the objective ground of my right standing before God. There also is the, the pattern for what I'm seeking to be conformed into in, in sanctification. Uh, through Christ, I have access to God. That, that there's an intrinsically Trinitarian shape to that, that confession, that comfort, that assurance. How do I know God is for me? Because Christ is my righteousness, because I have been reconciled to God through him. Hmm. You know, as, as Paul goes on and says in, in verses 10 and 11, I rejoice in God through Jesus Christ, through whom I've now received reconciliation. So even, even you know, in that sense, that's appealing to Christ as mediator, uh, which again has an, an implicitly Trinitarian structure to it because we're not excluding Christ from the Godhead when we relate to him as mediator, mm-hmm. but it's that God himself, God mediates God to me. Mm-hmm. You know, God, the, the spirit interceding for us, uh, Christ at the right hand of the father. Yeah, the me, even the mediation, right, has, is, 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 is Trinitarian in the sense that it's the son through whom we're, we're, we're approaching the father through the son. You had a corporate point to make. Oh, um, that uh, in a sense you can you uh, the same stuff writ large, the same stuff writ corporate in our our singing, our reading of scripture. Uh, I think this is, this is why it's helpful to confess Trinitarian creeds and confessions that kind of r- reminds us of the shape of our whole faith. Um, so yeah, tr- corporate worship should be Trinitarian uh, in so much as the Christian life is. Hmm. What are some common errors evangelicals make in the doctrine of the Trinity? I mean, certainly one. And and how does that hurt the church? Yeah, yeah. Both good questions. I I think uh, before that, I should uh, have not neglected. It's to my everlasting shame that I neglected mentioning John Owen's communion with God. (laughs) So distinct (laughs) and and particular relationship that we have with God in uh, fellowship with the the Father in his love, the Son in his grace, the Spirit in his consolation. Mm -hmm. So if you want to think about that more, John Owen, communion with God. Uh, What errors are What errors do we commonly make and how does it hurt the church? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so one evangelicals, we're, we're not talking about Mormons, Jehovah's witnesses, we're sure. talking about evangelicals. Yeah. Uh, one would be, uh, uh, taking the Trinity and flattening it out into our lives and, uh, essentially doing the opposite of what, uh, Stephen Holmes argued and just trying to make the Trinity work for everything. And so if, if I'm thinking about my marriage, in what way am I representing the father and my wife is representing the son or something like that? Um, having those sorts of applications, I think flatten the, di- the distance between the infinite God and the finite creature. Uh, mm-hmm. and so not using the Trinity as a pattern for kind of social action, uh, but recognizing there's a great gulf between the two of us. Is there any sense in which the church is an analogy for the Trinity or the Trinity for an analogy for the church? Anything in John 17 to draw from there? That was the big topic back in the 90s, Hmm. early 2000s, and that's what we studied back in the old days, (laughs) like 2004 and 5 on this doctrine. Is there, and I know social Trinitarianism is no longer in fashion, it's very, you know, problematic. But is there any sense in which the church reflects the Trinity that you would be willing to say? Oh, I think exegetically we have to say yes, in the sense that what Jesus prays for in John 17, 21, I, uh, tw- uh, yeah, 20 into 21, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that there's at least a point of analogy, a point of contact, where the unity of the church analogically corresponds to the unity of the Trinity. So so at the very least, and this is rooted in a broader biblical pattern uh, of, in a sense, the unity of the people of God corresponding to the oneness of God. Mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. God's oneness means he will have one people. Paul appeals to that, you mm-hmm. know, in Romans 3, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, for God is one, since God is one. He has one people. Mm-hmm. So there's even a broader biblical theological background there, mm-hmm. one God, one people. Mm-hmm. But here it's triune God, unified 
people. So it's even one click more specific that they may be one, that they may be unified. Um, but that said, I, I think I think I'd kind of put a, a hard limit there. There's a kind of analogical, uh, you know, freeway barrier, the kind of concrete divider, where I don't think Scripture gives us any more sort of detailed paradigm or program where this particular aspect of the church's order or structure or ethic or lived experience or whatever it might be has a kind of detailed uh, paradigm or archetype in the life of the Trinity. So I think the the fact of our unity, yes, absolutely, that's precisely what Jesus prays for. But I think beyond that, we have to have a real kind of reserve because I don't think Scripture specifies or gives us a more detailed program. And I think if we try to do that, kind of like Mark talked about, if we try to do that, we're sort of transgressing the creator-creature distinction of expecting yeah, yeah. that eternal relations within the creature, oh, excuse me, within the creator, map on in specific ways to the creature, right. which is just, uh, we're assuming too much continuity there. Right. Any other errors, brother, that you would point out? Well, I think, I, I think the kind of default one for, you know, genuine believers, pious evangelicals, doing their best to read the Bible and trying to understand God. Um, I think a kind of default one would be uh, accidentally, unintentionally importing creaturely concepts into the Trinity in ways that can scramble. All what sorts we were of just things. talking about. Yeah, that would be one example. But another example is is um kind of thinking about uh, God's action uh, in contrast to what I think is is a biblical understanding of uh, the inseparable operations of the Trinity that all that that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do toward the creation they do as one. Yep. Um, you could think about triune action as more of like a committee of three persons. Like we we three persons are collaborating to perform this mm. interview. We we are we you know creaturely categories are what we live with. They're what we exist in. They're what we know intimately. And it's easy to just kind of project that project creaturely realities, et cetera, onto the Trinity. That can lead to all sorts of mischief. Um, that would be a kind of broad, big picture one. And that tends to go in a tritheistic direction, doesn't it? It will tend in that direction. That's right. We ascribe to the divine person everything that's true of the human person in our separateness. That's right. And in so doing, forsake the one nature and one will. And that gets into all kinds of mischief, separating the will of the Father from the will of the Son and the atonement. It gets into all yeah. kinds of mischief of of assuming any kind of uh, inferiority on the part of the Son by virtue of, you know, um, seeing his uh, being sent as reflecting some type of inferiority or hierarchy. Yeah. Are critiques of penal substitutionary atonement sometimes, you know, wrathful father, victim son, uh, they seem to root in a kind of wrong Trinitarianism, don't they? Uh, I think one line of critique of penal substitution can and does do that. That's right. And so it, it fails to, if you want to say that penal substitution implies or assumes that, you know, the father's, uh, the father and the son have a kind of material difference of of will yeah. in a divine sense, and that it's the father pouring out his anger on a kind of unwilling subject know, or unwilling victim. I don't know that advocates of penal substitution say that, but that's the caricature at least that's given. Yeah, it's a charge. It's a, it's a charge lodged against advocates of penal substitution. And I think one important aspect of our response is uh, that the, the father, son, and Holy Spirit um, have one will. And the son, by virtue of the incarnation, does have a human will, yeah. which he submits to the father in the context of Gethsemane. Yeah. Uh, but that he, insofar as he is freely giving himself, freely offering himself, you know, I have authority to lay my life down. I have authority to yeah. take it up again. No one yeah. takes my life from me. The son is enacting his own role willingly, freely, voluntarily in the atonement, just as the father is. Guys, we're at almost 29 minutes. Very briefly, two or three minutes. What are useful ways to teach the doctrine of the Trinity to your church, obviously through your preaching, but just uh, unpack for us how you have thought about, I want my congregation to better understand the doctrine of the Trinity and how have you gone about it? Hmm. Certainly hand out good books. Uh, it's an easy way to get good theology. And all the, the elders at CHBC read the Scott Swain book? Scott we, Swain, yeah. And we read Biblical and Reasoning And Biblical too. Reasoning. That's yeah. right. So a good way to train up your elders in a kind of theology time, and then they can disciple and others. And then you're giving it to members of the church as well. That's right. We want okay. to encourage discipling relationships that would think through some of these things. Uh, more than that, I think within corporate worship, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, corporate worship is going to be Trinitarian. When we're praying, we're praying uh, to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. We are... We are uh, 
are going to be reciting uh, creeds uh, using those mm -hmm. uh, historic forms of expressing our faith yeah. uh, and growing into those confessions. Uh, I think in, in topical classes that we have, core seminars here at our church, uh, it would be a great thing to be studying some of those texts in a systematic way that exposition doesn't always afford when you're just uh, preaching one passage. Uh, so a few different ways there. I have an article on this on Nine Marks called something like Teaching the Trinity Through Expositional Preaching. Mm -hmm. And so I try to address Excellent it, piece. especially for that kind of main meal of the church. But I also suggest some of the things Mark does, having other teaching contexts like adult Sunday school classes, giving away books. Um, I do think you can briefly double click, just as you'll double click to explain uh, a historical matter or a translation mm -hmm. issue or a point of application or, or you know, co correcting a misunderstanding that we might import a kind of wrong American cultural assumption onto something. We can double click and do just a little bit of theological grammar, theological instruction, kind of giving people in, in as, as simple of language as possible, giving them some theological grammar with which to interpret the text. Yeah. I think you can do that as just little brief pastoral kind of asides and slowing down to help in, interpret the text in the context of an expositional sermon. I'll also say that um, this comes partly through, I taught through Hebrews and Romans in our Wednesday night Bible study over several years. And, you know, having another context of just straight up Bible teaching, but where it's a little more mm, flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Where, you, where you can kind of slow down and kind of park it a little bit. And yeah. it doesn't have all the same constraints of the kind of Sunday morning meal that's trying to feed everybody their main thing. Uh, having another context for just straight up teaching the Bible, I think affords you some flexibility where it's helpful to drop in a little bit more theological heavy lifting. Brothers, any other, I mean, we're, I'd love to keep talking. Hmm. We're past time though. Any final comments, any final reflections that you would want pastors to get either in their own study of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the beauty of the doctrine of the Trinity, teaching the church, anything at all? Uh, don't be intimidated by the doctrine of the Trinity. If you're a believer, you already know the Trinity. And so yeah. you're starting from insider knowledge of God. Hmm. Amen. Mark? Uh, it's a good word. I think also be charitable. As other people are learning the doctrine of the Trinity, we can easily become the Trinity police. Uh, use the wrong preposition there. Be charitable with others. Uh, we're all growing to talk about our Father better. Hey, Amen. Thanks, guys, for your time. Thank you. For more articles, books, and podcasts, please visit ninemarks.org.